Good evening, and this is Sid Moore, me, with, um, as promised, uh, extract from Witch Hunt. I'm going to do two tonight, and the first one is the prologue from Witch Hunt, because it's the first day in the book is October the 11th, and that's when it was published back in 2012, October the 11th. Today is October the 11th, so here we go. Here is the prologue to Witch Hunt. They told me not to come. He said, twill do no good. Not now. And he tried to touch my shoulder and bring me back into the court. But I was too quick and ran pushing through the crowd. Some saw me and stepped aside, unwilling to be touched, as if they might catch my sin. Others shrieked. I made off through the side lane. And then I came here. I have put on my cap and wrapped a shawl over too, so none may see me, though I see all. And I see them bound and tethered in a pen like sheep. Then there are the others, the eager spectators. So many clustered before me, edging their way forward, cramming to get a good view, that I can only catch, catch glimpses through the space between my neighbour's shoulders. On their faces, some have smiles. The girl beside me, only two or three years younger than I, licks her lips and stands up on her toes. Her father, in starched lace and black, pulls her back down and, with a stare, admonishes her excitement. But the woman beside him has a face full of glory. Her eyes are wide in anticipation. In her hands, she has a knife and fingers it greedily. She will cut hair from the dead for keepsakes to sell on. A hush falls over the crowd as the first is helped up to the scaffold. I can see from the way that she stumbles it is old Mother Clark. Her ancient face is creased with lines of age and knots of confusion. Two of the men assisting have taken an arm each to support her, for she cannot stand firm with but one leg. She staggers forward and clutches the man on her right to steady herself as the hangman pulls the noose over her head. A woman at the front near the gallows hurls something rotten. It hits Mother Clark on the chin and she looks about to throw some rebuke back, but before she can open her mouth comes the push. Her wizened frame drops and cracks as the noose does its work quickly, thank God, and she is turned off. Next, it is Anne Leach, younger than Mother Clark. She wrestles with the hangman as much as she can with her hands bound. There is little way to fight, but she will not go with that one. One of the throng, a man with a red beard and broad shoulders, goads her and calls, Witch, you will go to the devil now. Anne always had more spirit. And she spits at him and calls out a curse. The crowd stirs, excited by the show laughing as the hangman roughly slips over the noose. Anne is angry and wild. She begins to bring down a curse on the hangman, but cannot finish. A shove from behind stops her words, yet it does not stop her life, and she twists and turns on the end of the line like a fish from the brook. The hangman speaks to the man at his side and points to the crossbeam. The rope is coming apart. He calls for a ladder, but not in time for the rope to unravel and Anne falls with it to the ground, catching the side of the scaffold as she goes down. The crowd surges forward to watch. She is picked up and shown. To their delight, she has dashed out an eye and is carried back to the third noose and hanged once more. A deep red drip from her face darkens her dress, yet still the twitching goes on. The girl at the front runs forward to pull on her legs, but she is stopped by the broad-shouldered man. Above Anne, the hangman and his men throw up another rope. Elizabeth Clark is being taken down. I cannot see where they take her corpse. And then she is there. Her long black locks sway softly as she turns to the noose. I gasp as I see her watch Anne's feet jerking without rhythm. But she says nothing. She is solemn, silent and hearing of the jeers of the crowd come to witness her end. But I see her searching over the faces. For a moment, I think perhaps our eyes meet and I see in them a movement, a quick darting, a widening of the whites. 
Does she see me? I raise my face up and move back my shawl, bolder now, unconcerned by what the spectators may do if they recognise me. My confidence is short-lived. I pull back suddenly and flinch as the noose comes down over her slender neck. Her mouth opens and I think she too is about to speak, but I cannot be sure because she has been pushed from the stool. The noose has strung tight, her neck snaps to an unnatural angle, the feet kick out and then are still. And I fall to my knees and am sick across the cobbles. Oh God, have mercy, what have I done? So that is the prologue. And then the next section I'm taking from uh, further into the book. Um, so the book is, uh, has two timelines in it. One is, goes back to the 1645 witch hunts and the other is contemporary timeline, um, which looks at the protagonist, Sadie, who is a journalist writing a book about the Essex witch hunts. In this scene, she is visiting Colchester Castle with Felix, her editor, and they have just worked their way down and through the corridors to the dungeons in the basement. Okay. Hello. Felix's bo voice broke through my thoughts. I turned around to find him speaking into his mobile. Hang on, he said, then mouthed at me. You've got to take this call. He pointed upstairs. Back in a sec, okay? Ugh. I didn't really want to be left alone down here, but what could I do? Tell him I was a pussy and ask him to hold my hand? Mm -mm, not my style. I squeezed out a bright grin. Felix gave me the thumbs up and marched out of the jail. I was alone. There was, of course, nothing to worry about, I reassured myself. Thousands of tourists pass through these cells every year. Nothing untoward happened. I straightened my shoulders and stepped over to inspect the cell. It smelled rank. Curious dark patches stained the lower half of the walls. Don't even go there, I told myself firmly. In a place like this, it was important for a journalist to keep their imagination under control. The documentary soundtrack came to an end. The few school kids that had been squealing in the antechamber had gone now. But for the sound of my breathing, the silence was unbroken. I peeped through one of the metal grills at the cruel interior beyond. Dingy. Damp. The cell was so small, barely four and a half metres long. I could imagine moans and pleas falling on the merciless ears of the jailer, who, I had read, liked to beat those that cried out too loudly. The corners were particularly dark. That's where they crawled to, to die. I was beginning to feel a little claustrophobic, so I decided to head for the exit. That was enough for now. I had a sense of what it was like to be in here and a few extra details for my research. I could meet Felix upstairs. I fumbled in my bag opening the flap to replace my notebook. A loud, clattering bang echoed about the room. Looking up, I saw, in the entrance arch, the heavy wooden door had slammed shut. It was leaving me locked inside the jail. For a moment, I stood still, hesitating. Perhaps I should phone upstairs to reception. One glance at my mobile told me there was no signal in here, bugger. Instead, I took a wavering step towards the doorway, then stopped. Something rustled in the straw of the cell behind me. Surely a mouse. This was a dungeon in a castle. Of course they had mice. And rats probably too. Hmm. Nevertheless, the thin stretch of hairs at the back of my neck prickled to attention. The unseen thing rustled again though this was less of a rustle as such, more like the lurching sound of something heavy dragged across the dungeon floor. Although I didn't want to, I felt a compulsion to turn in its direction. So slowly, I moved my shoulders and body to face the sound. It was coming from the furthest corner of the cell, where the dying were chained. I couldn't see through the grid, so I took a step forward. The rustling receded and stopped. I stopped too and strained my ears. Nothing. 20 seconds passed as I held my breath and listened. 
nothing. Whatever was there, it had shuffled off into the gloom. I was just about to go back again and try the door handle when I heard another noise. This time, I froze. At first, I thought it was a hiccup, but it repeated itself. A high, faltering sob, quiet but clear. A woman's sob. To convey the fragility of the noise and the emotion it was steeped in, to describe it fully is impossible. All I can say is that it was like a whimper, quivering with endless misery, the sound of utter dejection. And it was coming from the corner of the cell. The lower portion of my throat made a muffled, squeaking noise, like the surprised yelp of startled dog or wounded dog. Get a grip, Mercedes. It's the recording. It started again, but with effects. I said it out loud. My voice was reassuring, it was real. A product of cause and effect, the words vibrated on my vocal cords and then issuing into the air, real. But then another voice reverberated through the cell. Are you there? I was fixed to the spot. No, this wasn't happening. Not here, not now, this wasn't real. I was imagining it. It was some kind of aural projection. Then it came again. I can hear you. Fragile, young, female. I'm sorry. I clapped a hand over my mouth and for a moment the bang bang of my heart overwhelmed all other senses. I took a gob of air through my fingers and was filled with an intolerable stink, sulfuric, stagnant, death ringing. But still the sobbing went on. Mercy. Then another voice cut through, louder, a kind of throaty gurgle, far more horrible than the one before, nasty, ill, wheezing. My breath was coming in quick pants, beads of sweat, sweat running down the sides of my face. The dark voice came again, harsh, full of bass and resonance. Leave us. As I recalled from the awful sound, a horrid sensation came up from my stomach, a tense, knotted emotion, displeasure, fear, repugnance, disgust, horror, all of that, all at once, rising up from the very soul, like the spasm of an unflexed muscle or a memory long forgotten. Something in the prison made a creaking sound and suddenly very real terror was upon me. There was a footfall in the cell. Fear spilled over and I thrust out my hand, ready to defend myself, rotating my head to the sound, texting myself for a fight. Through the cell window, I was just able to glimpse something that looked like a stained sack moving against the far wall. And then the lights went out. So there you go. And if you want to find out what happens next, then by witch hunt. <laughs> oh, thanks, Molly.